What is up, everybody? I am Jason Trost, the host of Bet- Betting. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> it's going to be in the high takes. Yes, yes, yes. What is up, everybody? I'm Jason Trost, the host of Business of Betting podcast. I'm really excited for today's guest, Nigel Eccles. He's, amongst other things, been the founder of FanDuel. He's got a new startup. Um, he's been around the industry for donkey's years. Uh, probably uh, longer than I have, I think, by a couple of years. Um, I'm super excited to have him on the show because he's somebody I've known forever. Uh, he kind of comes at this industry from a love of building consumer products and a real understanding of the fundamentals of sports betting and, and the, the potential it holds. Him and I share a lot of views on the frustration that uh, you know the industry hasn't moved faster, further, and uh, we have a lot of, um, of good conversations about that. So I'm really excited to try to get into some of those topics uh, on the show. So welcome to the show, Nigel. Thanks for having me on. Cool. Why don't, uh, I don't know, do you want to go down memory lane a little bit and tell the yeah, audience how we, should... we met? Do you remember how we met? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I remember telling you this markets was a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> Back in, what, 2008, 2009? Something like that. It was, yeah. So I remember then when the world was kind of falling apart that time. Yeah. So like my, my background in the betting industry. So I first started, I joined Flutter.com as it was then in 2000. Uh, we were a competitor to Betfair. Well, actually, more accurately, Flutter was a person-to-person betting site. So I think that sort of the investor tagline was the eBay of bets. Since you would go in and there's this sort of eBay of like, pick your bet, pick your odds, uh, pick your opponent. It was sort of half a brilliant idea and half a terrible idea because you can imagine you go into the eBay of bets and you're like, you're, you're like, look, I just want to have a bet at whatever the price is. And um, so we had this massive sort of jumble sale of bets. Um, the idea also was that it would be person to person and that would be like loads of fun. Um, that didn't really work. Um, and it didn't work then for the same reason why everybody else who sort of tried it since then doesn't really work. But at the same time as we had launched, Betfair had launched, but we were very dismissive of them. We were like, oh, they're, they're like for hardcore and that's a very small market. I remember a lot of the investors that turned Betfair down invested in, fan, in, in, in Flutter because Flutter was like going to be this mass market product. Um, and so uh, Flutter had raised like 40 million. Um, and surprisingly enough, when I joined them, I think I was employee number 85 or something, 86. Uh, I was one of the few that only really had any significant betting experience. And I looked at it and I looked at Betfair and I went, well, this is way better. <laughs> and so it was kind of awkward working for Flutter. And so in 2021, uh, I was given the job, this, you know, laugh at this. I was given the job of kill Betfair. <laughs> it's like we had more money. Not 2021. You're talking about the, uh, 2001, 2001. Sorry. 2001. 2000 net off 20 years. 2001. Yeah. Kill Betfair. Um, and, you know, we were half successful. We didn't kill them, but we launched a competitive product. The start of 2001, I think we had like 4% or 3% market share of a market uh, that was, I think, about 50 million in handle. Uh, that is annualized. And um, by the end of 2021, we had a 30% market share and the industry was had 500 million in handle. So explosive. Um, but if you remember towards the end of 2001, which was a really bad bear market, obviously, uh, the dot-com bust had happened. 9-11 happened in September. Uh, by the end of 2001, everyone was freaking out. Uh, and so our investors were like, you know what? be kind of better to have a smaller share of a sure thing than, you know, uh, own a hundred percent of, uh, of something that might not work out. And so basically they pushed and, and our founders agreed to merge with Betfair. Um, and that was a 70, 30 split. Uh, so our investors got uh, 30% of what became Betfair. Um, and that was really down to the, the betting exchange. Uh, it was, essentially a takeover. There was only probably a very small number of people from Flutter that went over. Um, the combined company only had about 30 or 40 people. And then it just really exploded after that. Um, there was no competition um, and it just gained massive traction. Um, I stayed for a little bit post-merger um, doing some work. 
uh, for Andrew Black. And I, you know, really like Andrew, actually, he's quite fun to work with. Um, and then I left and then had a five month non compete and I actually went and then relaunched another competitor called BetDAC, uh, which was based in Dublin, was set up by Dermot Desmond. Um, and so, Derm, uh, BetDAC, I think at one stage was the number two in the market. Uh, he had he had set it up originally as a way for him and other billionaire friends to like share, you know, hundred thousand dollar bets. It was a horrible product, com- almost completely unusable. I-, I think the intention was that they wouldn't use it themselves; they would just ask somebody to use it. You know, a little minion would go in, and you know, the interface was unusable. Um, it was built on Orbis, which became OpenBet. Um, it, it was a really, really bad product. And so we spent 12 months relaunching it and relaunching it essentially as a, like a Betfair clone. Um, it, it looked like Betfair looked like and deliberately. Um, but purple. And so that was sort of into What's that? But purple. It was Betfair, but, but purple. But purple. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but purple. Uh, I actually, there was one innovation I got into it, which was the... Uh, basically the odds history, which uh, it actually showed whether odds, it was a steamer, whether the, you know, the odds are coming down or going up and it just showed the odds. Oh, I didn't know that was, that, that was you. That was one of the things was, I noticed on bed deck. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Oh, that it was, was cool. Like it was yeah, kind it of inspired cool. by what, what you saw on the, on the track. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think it was there for years. It was there for like at least 15 years. So I was quite chuffed at that. I never liked uh, Betfair's like kind of chart, like inverse ratio thing, it just kind of was really clunky. You know, in time, I've kind of like, okay, it's a better trading screen, but it didn't feel as authentic for like horse racing. Mm. Um, so yeah, so then that was like in the summer 2003. Uh, and then after it launched, I left um, and I actually got into the industry for a while. Um, and then it was only back when 2007, we started a prediction market, played play money prediction market called HubDub. And then that uh, pivoted. It was a fun product and we raised money and we got a lot of press, but it didn't have a business model. And then in 2008, another financial crisis, uh, we had just raised a Series A. Um, and within a month, I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is not working. We need a real business model. And that's when we came up with FanDuel. And so we launched FanDuel in summer 2009. And I think I met you around 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, and you were like, hey, we're going to launch a competitor bet fair. And I haven't had launched two of those and had, you know, partial success with one and pretty much failure with the other was like, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> Uh, like it's you know like and and it, the liquidity effect is just so challenging i remember at one point bet back was like half the commission like we just slashed commissions and didn't matter and and you said you were uh into horse racing and and punting mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff is that why you took a job at flutter or was it just serendipitous yeah or? yeah i you know 2000 i was actually a consultancy i'd left college uh i think 98 um, and you studied and maths, it, right? Yeah, I, I studied maths and uh, probability. That was kind of my big interest. Um, and I was mostly, so I was very interested in gambling um, and probability. I've, I'd always just thought it was a fascinating uh, subject area. Um, and then horse racing is something I actually got into when I was at Flutter. Um, like, obviously, we had a few people there who were really passionate about that and uh, I, I kind of grew to love it there. Um, but, and, and those, and Betfair and Flutter and BetDAC were really primarily horse racing products. Um, a, a little thing we can point at is if you look at the interface of Betfair, which hasn't changed in 20 years, I'm sure you know, um, it's actually was built for horse racing. That's why you have this sort of long vertical scroll because you need something that can handle like 15, 20 horses. Um, it's not really designed for football where you have like three outcomes. Um, and that's why it's kind of been clunked around, but it still was primarily built for horse racing. How many businesses have you founded now? Two or three? Uh, ooh, Two? Um, so those are all ones that I joined. Like I relaunched BetDAC, so it was you know, pretty much fundamentally changed. But then I started HubDub in 2007. Uh, that pivoted to become FanDuel. So same company, same employees, same shareholders uh, in 2009. And then since leaving there, I've started uh, three companies. Okay, so you're you've done 
four companies then. Four, I guess, yeah. I think I knew I wanted to start a company or at least had the idea I wanted to start a company from an early age. Did you have that idea or did that come later to you in life? I don't think so. Like I remember um, one of the things was I'd say in the UK, um, there was kind of like, I don't, there was technology wasn't a sort of like prevalent and, and technology businesses. So I remember like being at college and um, sort of considering studying computer science, but like at the time it felt like computer science was a kind of a road into being like a, an engineer in a very sort of technical sense. Like, you know, it was kind of like engineers at the time were sort of viewed like sort of like a back office job. I wouldn't say I was a huge entrepreneurial before that. Um, and so, no, I kind of, I was more sort of driven by the stuff that I was kind of interested in and um, as opposed to like wanting to start a company. It was only once I'd been in a startup, I'm like, oh, this, this is really cool. This is really fun. Like actually building something and put it in the hands of customers and watching them like throw up all over it <laughs> <laughs> and then go, okay, let's go fix all the stuff that I, you know, I really got the bug. So when you yeah. were at Flutter and BetDeck and, and Betfair, you weren't thinking like, oh, I want to learn the ropes to do another gambling business down the road. You were more just a young guy who's inter interested in this industry and rolling your sleeves up. Yeah. Like, you know, I was, I was like, you know, when I joined Flutter. I was like the most junior product manager there. Um, and, you know, the good news was I was the most junior product manager and quickly it became, I was the most junior product manager, but the only one I knew anything about betting. <laughs> so one of the ironic things about Flutter was that they sort of set themselves up. They'd sold investors and now this isn't the next Ladbrokes. So Ladbrokes was only worth a couple of billion then, right? It's not, it wasn't a big home run. It was worth sold a couple to investors. Of billion now. Too, yeah, so. <laughs> if that. Yeah. Um, you know, they were going to be the next Disney. And so they deliberately hired people who didn't have sports betting or, or betting experience. And I was kind of the exception. And so whenever the company was like, oh, we're really a betting company. I was one of the few people who actually knew anything about betting. And so I was given the job of like kill Betfair, you know, which was going to be like a sideline and suddenly became the main business. Mm -hmm. Also watched the business very closely, you know, just being in the industry. And, and I feel like Betfair really had a chance to kind of, play the role of the Google of the industry. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think if, if they did this, that, you know, if they played their cards, right. Um, I think focus on sports betting, focus on technology, mm -hmm. focus on the consumer experience, leave casino, leave poker, don't do any yeah. of that shit. I think, and, and drop your prices. I think they would have crushed the industry. Do you, do you share mm -hmm. that point of view? Um, so I think Bedford had a lot of mistakes. Um, I actually, and I think they um, survived all of those mistakes by just having that market dominance of liquidity. Um, I think that so some of those mistakes were um, like an early one was just a lack of customer focus. I think they denied that they were a betting company, mm -hmm. you know, so where Flutter thought we were Disney. I sort of think that Betfair thought, I think they were quite open that we were a technology company. And I think they failed to actually understand their customers. Um, I think also they were probably too sort of city focused um, that they didn't realize that their customers were largely people living you know, outside of London. Um, they weren't necessarily traders. I don't think that they understood that there was a mass market that um, valued uh like simplicity uh, uh valued bonus va valued entertainment i actually think that paddy par did a much better job with that um i think so i think their core product i and i actually think they could potentially have addressed both markets and i think they always sort of fell down between that so there's one market which is this value market and i think they by de facto kind of gobbled that market up but just, I think, made executional mistakes on that. And then they totally failed on the casual market because the interface, like from day one, I think their attitude to the market was all of these casual betters will become value betters. Like we'll show them a better product and then they'll just come over and use this. And that was just fundamentally wrong. But even if it was true, their product was just so badly executed 
and onboarding was so difficult that it just never happened. So I think they just sort of, they failed to understand the casual market and they also failed to deliver a product for it anyhow. And then on the value side, yeah, like they just, they missed that market repeatedly um, in terms of delivering to that market. Yeah, I, I largely agree with that. If you were to give Betfair a post-mortem, I mean, do, do you have a theory as to why they under-executed? Or my, my theory has always been they, they got, they had really early success. And I think early, like easy, mm. quote unquote, easy early success can be a, a double-edged sword because, you know, you stop, you can take your eyes off the ball a lot easier. That could, that could be part of it. And I also think they had a big march towards their IPO. I think mm -hmm. there's like two, three, four years where the company is really geared towards the IPO process, like buttoning everything up. And yeah. once you kind of go down that very banker driven IPO process, it becomes a stale, boring, you know, mm. sucks the life of, out of a company. And my third theory is that poker was their gateway drug to just becoming a, um, a generic gambling company and losing sight mm. of that kind of cutting edge sports betting tech team. What do you think of those hypotheses yeah. for lose it, losing sight of the price? So what was the, the, the first one was early success, 100%. The, the company was just, in a way, too successful too quickly. Mm. Like they had, they had a genuinely innovative product. Um, and they also then, some of the artifacts of that product, the innovations they brought to the industry, like a classic one was in-play betting. Like, you know, we were, we were doing in-play betting in 2001 as was Betfair, right? And and uh, and I've been in panels where I've seen, you know, Bet365. Yeah, wasn't Ray inventing. Winston doing in-play betting? <laughs> You're inventing it. And I'm yeah. like, what? <laughs> inventing it in 2005. And I was like, no, you popularized it, which all credit to them. But so, you know, Betfair yeah. totally missed it. They had this huge innovation yeah, and they just totally missed it. And they totally missed that market. They totally missed the opportunity to market it. Um. And so I think, and then they were like, well, we're successful, we're growing, you know, we're grip margins, but I think that was right. So, but I think that was a failure on the marketing side. Um, the March towards IPO, I don't think necessarily like, you know, same time Google was IPOing. What was it, 2004, 2005, Google IPO'd and, you know, built a pretty successful company. Um, so yeah. I just think that, I don't think that necessarily is a problem. I think... I think there's a sort of a DNA question there, which was um, like historically Betfair, and like Betfair is a huge success. Like it's still mm, a huge success, but it's yeah. kind of like, but let's be open about where it failed. Um, complete failure of marketing repeatedly, F complete failure to understand its customer and a complete failure to be able to talk to your customer. Like, like even internally, like, I mean, a lot of my friends are there, were there for a very long period of the early 2000s, and they were like, yeah, marketing's a joke. Like, the product keeps growing despite marketing, you know, every new initiative. And they never really could figure out how to market it. They were like, is it a, you know, are we trying to sell? I remember when at Flutter we had, like, marketing agencies come and pitch different concepts and they were all like, oh, it's betting against other people. It's a carnival. It's it's price. And there was all these things. And it was funny. And over the next 10 years, Betfair rolled through every one of those, like, ideations. And none of them really made a ton of sense. Mm. Um, and, like, we kind of kicked them down in 2000. But they all kind of, like, you know, there was the carnival and the, the little people and, and then the opponents. And so... I just think it was a real failure on their part, on their marketing side to understand it. And then I also feel it was a failure on the product side to kind of say, hey, I really understand the customer. This is how we're going to evolve the product. This is how we're going to build a casual product for people who don't want to understand like market depth and how to lay and do all of this stuff. That was a real failure as well. Mm. Yeah, I know we're we're both beating up on Betfair, but it, mm. it, it, we like I am I, I assume you you share the sentiment like it's amazing what they've been able to build. It's actually one of the UK's biggest success stories uh, mm -hmm. from a yeah. startup. And usually, when people think of typical startups, they they forget to they forget putting Betfair in the list. But it, you know, Betfair yeah. is right up there. So they've they've yeah. done something right. I just I'm I'm. You know, just sitting on the as somebody that's been intimately watching them for years, I think they had a chance to really mm -hmm. be ten, fifty x the size that they are today. Uh, I one hundred percent agree. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I just, yeah, I one hundred percent agree. And I think where if I compare them with successful companies at the time like Google, 
you know, deep product focus, deep understanding of their customers. You know, these, the Google is a comparator, right? At the same time, uh, mm. or even Spotify, deep understanding of what the customer wants. Betfair just did not have that. And then that deep understanding in those companies translate into product innovation. Again, Betfair just could not execute that. Um, yeah. And in the end, what happens is that, you know, when you can't do that, then you sort of grow through consolidation, which is worthy. But I would say from my point of view, just genuine, I just kind of think a bit boring. Like, I'm like, great, that's great. Bankers will love it. It's, you know, accredited to shareholders. But like, I just, there's very few great companies, unless you're really great at it. And I'd say NTN is great at it, uh, like growing through acquisition and mergers. It doesn't get me excited. What it get, excites me is when you like, you know, build a company with a great product focus, a real understanding of consumers, and you manage to deliver a product that people love and you just grow through that. Um, that's what gets me excited. And that's, you know, if we look at iconic US companies, um, that's what they all do. Or, or like Spotify, there's European ones that, that mm. do this as well. That's what they do. And, and that that's kind of the disappointment, I'd say, that, that I feel towards it. Yeah. Absolutely. So l l let's pivot over to your FanDuel journey. I mean, you exited the business when the business was sold to back to Flutter, ironically. Mm -hmm. In well, not 20... back to Flutter, it was the it was Flutter two point oh. The, the, the acquire was, you know, yeah. It was so obviously Flutter. Betfair had gone public as Betfair, and when they kind of put together a bunch of brands, they were like, "Hey, it's kind of weird." They had they lived for a while as was a Paddy Par Betfair or Betfair Paddy Par. Um, and in the end, and then they had sports bet in Australia and then they were like, you know what, let's, let's find a neutral brand. And then down the back of the sofa, they had this old flutter brand. Uh, and so they picked that. Um, and yeah, so they then, well, they merged their U S division with FanDuel in 2018. And I, I left, uh, almost about six months before that. Okay, cool. Okay. So in 2018, um, FanDuel merged with with Flutter. As as somebody that's that's watched from the sidelines, I mean, you know, FanDuel has incredible brand reach in America. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's almost like a byword for sports betting at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe this is me more curious as a founder, but what is it like to watch this company that you took from baby to adolescence or adulthood, and it's not in your hands anymore, and this mm -hmm. name is living out in the wild? but yeah. you, you have no involvement with There's it. No what does that feel like? It's definitely weird. Uh, yeah, it is very strange. I, I got off a flight uh, a couple of months ago and there was two people in front of me and they had like Fandil swag on, like Fandil bags and stuff. And I was like, that's kind of weird. And then I, I ended up got chatting to them and I was like, oh, where'd you get the Fandil stuff? And they were like, oh yeah, I work for them. And I was like, oh really? <laughs> I was like, oh, I just started chatting them for a while. And they're like, you seem to know a lot about Fandil. And I'm like, yeah, I, <laughs> a little bit. I started it. <laughs> it was, uh, so it's definitely weird. And like, you know, and it's obviously with sports, you see Fandil all the time, but like, even like there's a road I drive out of New York that's sponsored by Fandil. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, it's going everywhere. So it's, like I will say, it's great to see. I'm I'm super excited to see how successful it is. Um, I'm really happy that our thesis was right. Like uh, I remember in 2015, 16, there was commentators saying if sports betting happens, these guys are going to be roadkill. You know, the big casinos are going to shut us down. And I was like, I don't believe that. I think we have such a strong brand and we have such a strong team in terms of customer acquisition and a strong user base that we will have a much stronger advantage in the casino groups would be, and it's great to see that's a hundred percent. Right. Um, so that part's great. It's definitely, it's definitely a strange thing to see it. Uh, like just an anhack. They have no, I, I still get customer service complaints <laughs> on Twitter. I get people like DMing me or, you know, adding me about, you know, what a scam vandal is, <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, okay, that I did leave like six years ago, so I'm not really sure I'm the best person to help. Um, but yeah, but it's great. It's, it is great to see, but it, it's, it's definitely a weird, weird thing to see. So I remember we were on the roof of Passion Capital, and mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this, but we we're sitting on the roof terrace, and you were telling me about Hub Dub, and you just mm -hmm. went to South by Southwest uh, and pivoting into sports um, fantasy, rather yeah. daily fantasy. Like, 
what and that was i think that chat would would have been like 2010 or 11 yeah something like that yeah. like at what point did your vision pivot from because you started as a play money prediction market and then you went into mm-hmm. real money real daily money. fantasy yeah. when did this idea of sports betting start to become the future so you know the issue with sports betting in the u.s was it was prevented by federal law paspa um, and th- it was very hard to make a prediction when that would get repealed. Like we always felt it was weird that the U.S. was going to, in one category, which you know the rest of the world had pretty much embraced. Like even countries that had sort of fought it, like France or, or Italy, had sort of finally embraced and regulated. It felt weird that the U.S. was so out of sync, given also that how. Uh, passionate Americans were about sports and actually largely about sports betting as well. So it just sort of felt weird. Uh, we felt that fantasy sports was white space where we could grow a business. And then, and then if sports betting didn't happen, we could grow a very successful business um, in its own right. So that was kind of the first part. It's like, look, we don't need sports betting. We can build a really successful business here. But we always thought that if sports betting happened, uh, and we didn't know how it would happen. We always sort of thought if it were to happen, then we'd be in an incredibly strong position to to capture it. Um, and that was just kind of like the thesis. There wasn't really much point in planning for it because like there was no way, and or even to try and sort of lobby for it because, you know, you would have to over, you know, overturn federal law. Um, we definitely worked with the NBA and and. T- uh, 2015 16 that they started to embrace it they started to say like the law should change this is because they own part of fanduel right they did they had a small stake a very yeah. small stake in fanduel and so we got to know them and and adam silver i don't think it's a controversial statement is to say like the most forward-thinking commissioner by significant margin and so in 2015 he was already saying this law is ridiculous we think this not only would fans really enjoy this, but this would be good for sport. It would yep. break this illegal market onshore. It would create create tax revenue. So, like, there was kind of like we were like, yeah, this guy's right, you know. And uh, so we worked with him. You know, we certainly did a bit of lobbying, but like ultimately, the law changed because the Supreme Court struck down PASPA. But you got out of that version of sports betting in at least American sports betting in 2018. Like, do you think that the Knowing what you knew then, like, did, did the industry go the way you thought it would, or are there surprises? I honestly would say the biggest surprise has been that it's been, is in line with what I thought, right? Like, I thought that, um, so we knew whenever PASPA was repealed that there would be a steady rollout of states. So that, that that's unsurprising. Like, everyone would have thought that, like, there was going to be a steady march. Um I also thought that it would be a steady march. Like we've seen this in every other form of gaming in the US, like one state gets a casino and then suddenly it's like two states and then, you know, it proliferates, um, it spreads or, you know, one state gets a casino and puts it right up on the border with that other state. And then the other state's like, screw this, all our all our taxpayers are going over to that state and losing money over there, we'll do our own casinos. Um, so I did assume that there would be momentum uh, and that's happened. Uh, but I think a lot of people sort of thought that. Um, I think the one thing that I thought from day one um, that I think a lot of people would have disagreed with me was I always thought that Fangio and DraftKings would dominate the market. Um, I just felt that uh, they had a number of advantages that uh, that it was very, very hard for other players to compete with. Um, and those advantages being number one brand just associate like they've got a brand that is associated with something that's very like sports betting which is you know daily fantasy sports they have a huge customer database um and that customer database is of young male sports fans who like something that's very like sports betting um Mm -hmm. huge advantage every time a state opens up fans on DraftKings start off with you know depending on how big this data is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of customers who they can cross sell so that is a huge advantage and also, you know, on day one, uh, FanDuel and DraftKings were like, you know, 400, 500 person organizations who were built to, you know, build a product and market it to online sports fans, right? Whereas, you know, you take somebody like MGM or Caesars and like they had to like scrape around to like MGM is a classic. MGM is an obvious winner in this market and have done a fantastic job, but 
I remember them in 2018, like going, yeah, you know, we have to get this guy over from the UK, but we can't get his green card or we can't get his visa and we have to do an intercompany transfer. And so it was just really hard for them to get it together. Um, and it took them a couple of years. MGM is the one that did a really great job on it. But other entrants like, you know, Caesars or Wynn, like you know, three years in, they're like kind of putting together a team and it's like, it's kind of too late. And you, you know, by the time you sort of put together your starting lineup, you know, fans and DraftKings have sort of lapped you four times. And so I, I definitely did think that they would, um, sort of, you know, at least be the number one and two players but probably possibly dominate the market. So that that's kind of been within, you know, what I thought might happen and that's what happened. Knowing what you know about exchanges and your, your thoughts on the Betfair interface and the miss opportunity mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, why didn't you, why didn't you build an exchange in the U S market? Um, so a couple of things about exchanges. Um, so I think, I think exchanges is an incredible product. I think it's, um, it's much more centered towards uh, value customers and sophisticated players. Um, I'd say the U.S. even today is still a fairly unsophisticated market. Um, and by unsophisticated, I mean somebody asked me, "What's the, you know, <laughs> I guess like analyst asked me, said like, how does a user choose between Fangio and DraftKings?" And I'm like, well, usually it's the first one they see an ad for, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then they then they then they'll go. It's amazing. I can bet on my phone. There's an app I can download in the app store and I can bet on it. Yeah. And I'm like, that's amazing. We could do that in Europe like 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so like, it's an unsophisticated market. It'll become sophisticated, you know, once we, you know, with a bit more development, I think actually, you know, now I would say markets like New Jersey are becoming more sophisticated. People are more shopping around. They're like trying different apps, but you know, when a new market opens up, like it is like, it is massive to go from having an offshore sports book where you've got a guy where you get, you know, send money to and you might never see again to actually just being able to go into the app store and download an app and bet. Mm. Like that is a game changer. And the incremental improvement between that and the slightly better sports book isn't that big in the early stages. Mm. Um, and so the problem with like launching an exchange in day one is I, I just don't think that the market would have said, oh, wow, this is amazing because they're like, they're ready. Like, they're just thinking it's amazing you bet on your phone. So, so do we you just sort of felt that the market wasn't as developed. But, but is your hypothesis that eventually an exchange will be appropriate in the U.S. market? Um, that's a good question. Um, there's a number of challenges to the U.S. One is just like um, uh, liquidity and the cross border. Like, so the U S is actually not one market. It's, as you know, it's, it's going to be like 50 separate markets. If we have all 50 States, um, exchanges need liquidity. It's like poker. Um, we need, we need to have the ability to pull bets from multiple jurisdictions. Um, and it's not clear if the U S is, well, th that part is still unproven how that's going to work. Um, and so that's why, I sort of am less bullish on the U.S. I just don't know where it ends up there. Um, I do think, I do think exchange is a fundamentally better product for the value end of the market. And I do think there's a big opportunity there. The way I view it, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. Um, everybody generally in the, in the industry sees uh, sports books as apples and exchanges being oranges, but I see them as... Mm -hmm both apples, different kinds of apples. Mm -hmm. And the sports book is a very simplified version of an exchange, uh, but the underlying technology of a fixed odds bet at this price is the same. And yeah. an exchange is basically a sports book that lets you buy and sell and do other kinds of exotic things with the mm -hmm. sports bet. So to me, the question is not, should there be an exchange in the US or not? The question is more fundamentally, what interface does a user want to use? Yeah. And underneath the hood should be an exchange because of mm -hmm. all the positive externalities you get with pooling, liquidity, trading, et cetera, et cetera. Do you buy that hypothesis that an exchange should be underneath the hood of all sports books and it's just a question of interface? Or do you think that the the old school model, you know, like the open bet, FanDuel, mm -hmm. Ladbrokes model of like siloed liquidity, traders, mm -hmm. ring fence setup is the right one? So... 
I, yeah, I do think there is, there's something in what you say. It's, it's really a question of interface rather than technology. It's the same product and it's like a fixed odds bet. Um, uh, and it's, it's something where, you know, if you look at, you know, Betfair has really failed to innovate, which is like what interface you show customers. Like they really essentially have one, which is kind of like their pro uh, view. Um, the, I guess one of the questions though is, um, is the product you're selling to a customer um, a low margin uh, product with very little bonusing or is it a high margin product with, with bonusing? And what we've seen in retail, both in the UK and the US is what they're really pushing is this sort of high margin product with, with significant bonusing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's where the product is sort of subtly different. You know, it's kind of harder to do that on an exchange Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that would be the only one, but there, you could still have an exchange element to it, which is you can still manage your risk on an exchange. Like you could be taking on retail and then, you know, blowing some of that onto an exchange so that you're less dependent on results. I, so I do think that's an opportunity, but you're not necessarily exposing that to the customer. Yeah. I don't think the pricing in, in my worldview, I don't think the pricing is dependent on the technology could be, mm. you know, I would think about it more like a financial market. You know, if you're buying stock through Charles Schwab, like they artificially can give you a worse price and, and charge yeah. more fees for that transaction. Yeah. But ultimately that, that transaction is getting routed to the New York stock exchange or FX is another classic example. Yeah. Of you have the wholesale market and the retail market. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm, I'm surprised at how few people in the industry see it that way. A lot of people like think exchanges, they're exotic, they're off to the side, they're niche for pros. But I really see exchanges being like, that's the right model to run a sports book mm-hmm. even. And um, whether or not you expose some of the buying and selling to the customer, I think is more of a, it's more of a broker level problem and not the core technology problem. Yeah, no, I, I, I pretty much agree with that. Um, I pretty much agree with that. That's, um, and if uh, if you think about how we're building bet decks, um, we can talk about that in a moment. So the idea behind bet decks is that it is a common set of liquidity that is pooled between multiple clients. Um, and though some of those clients will go down a route of building something that is very simple for a retail side and maybe with much higher margin, um, and other ones are going to go, no, we're just focused on the most you know sophisticated, deep look into the market. And it's more of a trader view, but it's a common common set of liquidity. So let's pivot to bet, bet decks. So mm-hmm. um, I'm a crypto skeptic, and I've been really looking mm-hmm. forward to being challenged on some of my maybe stereotypes yeah. I have about crypto. Why don't you Why don't you tee up the company, mm-hmm. what you're trying to do, and and why you did it? Yeah. So um, so bet deck. So I like I'd say almost since I left uh, bet in 2003. Um, I've always sort of thought there was a better way of building a betting exchange. Um, but the sort of fundamental challenge was that Betfair had liquidity and I never sort of thought it would make sense to go head to head with them. Um, and so I just kind of put that on the back. Who would ever do such a thing? Who would ever do something so crazy? Um, and so it wasn't until about, uh, two years ago, 2020, maybe early 2021, um, and so I'd looked at a number of like sort of prediction markets, um, like, um, think of Augur, Gnosis, and I thought they were interesting. Um, uh, and everywhere there's always been a lot of excitement towards prediction markets in crypto, but I also sort of realized that most of the guys building us like knew nothing about sports betting and also didn't realize that prediction markets are a tiny percentage of the market compared to sports betting. Um, and, uh, they would be like, oh, this is great. You can predict when the next Cardano upgrade is. And I'm like, you and five people give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a very active market. And I said, whereas, you know, there are hundreds of horse races every day, which has got tens of thousands of people who care real amounts of money about that. Um, mm-hmm. That's where, uh, or, or football games, right? Like th- th- this is where the market is. Um and so I looked at those, I toyed with those in 2017, 18, and was like, yeah, these are not going anywhere. Um, the other problem was that Ethereum is just like too slow, too expensive. Um, so today, Ethereum transaction costs, they've managed to get them down to about 
They've come down to about five dollars. They haven't brought them down. It's just because there's not as much demand on block space per transaction. Per transaction, yes. What? Yeah, Ethereum oh, is like super expensive. Oh, I yeah, thought that if you're was buying like an NFT. You're paying like five dollars in gas fees. I thought it's one of Ethereum's things was uh, cheap transaction fees. Yeah, yeah, no. So basically, okay. the challenge with Ethereum is that it, it, like they have a certain amount of block space. Um, they uh, and it's fairly slow. And there's a lot of demand. And so when you have a lot of demand and very little supply, the, um, basically Ethereum has what's known as a gas market. So the cost goes up and the people who are willing to pay the most get the transaction. And that has steadily gone up as it's become oh, more I see. in demand. Um, so it kind of becomes worse as it becomes more popular. Correct. Yes. Okay. And um, so... That, so that was like another problem. It's like, look, can't run a. Oh, and the other problem was uh, speed. It's slow. Uh, mm -hmm. Ethereum. So you couldn't really build um, a betting exchange on Ethereum because it was expensive and it was slow. So in start of two thousand uh, last year, um, I started looking at, a, at an alternative. It's called L one, a current blockchain called Solana. Um, and the thing about Solana is that it's built in a way that is very fast and very cheap. Uh, so transaction costs are like fractions of a cent and it can handle something like, uh, well, it's currently running about three or 4,000 transactions per second, but it's architected in a way that it can really scale to potentially 50,000 transactions per second and kind of get up to sort of NASDAQ speed. And so when I saw that, I said, well, okay, well, here we have, um, here we have a, uh, a platform in L1 where, Actually, we could build something. In a what does L1 stand fashion. for? Oh, sorry. L1 just means, so Ethereum is an L1. It's level one. Sometimes on top of that, you build like a, so Ethereum, there's scaling solutions like Optimism, Arbitrum, they're called L2s. And so they are like cheaper blockchains on top of Ethereum. You're talking it's about the level of abstraction. Y yes. Well, it's kind of like you have this base level, a okay. base blockchain, which is like Ethereum, Solana, Cardano. These are these are. And then L1s. there's something built on Solana that's called L2, and then you can build something. On uh, yeah. L2 well, called it's L Solana, L3. less of Solana, more Ethereum, because Ethereum is so okay. expensive. Okay. They're, they're like, okay, I can't like build something on that. I'll, I'll build a uh, an L2 on top of that. Okay. Um, and then we can run our application on that cheaper, cheaper. Right. Layer. Okay. So Solana is Solana, Solana, Solana is cheaper, blah, 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 better, Faster. better mousetrap. Mm -hmm. Why, why an exchange on, why, sure. why an exchange on this? Right. So if we go back uh, in the history of Betfair, there's a couple of reasons. It's good examples of why something I guess would make sense. Um, uh, one area is on sort of third party development. So Bedfair did have a, you know, you know, did have third party developers, uh, but there was a couple of problems. One was there was, wasn't really a clear way for them to make money. Like they couldn't charge a commission. So, you know, you could use Bedfair's API, but you couldn't like add on your own charges to it. Right. Um, number two, uh, so you didn't really have a business model or you could kind of charge customers like a commission or like a, a service fee, but it wasn't a very attractive business. And also you were totally dependent on Betfair. So Betfair could go, you know what? We don't really like that application. We're just going to cut it off. So you have this thing called platform risk. And, and you know that as an entrepreneur is disastrous because you know, not only do you have that horrible risk, but when you go to raise money, investors are like, well, you're telling me that Betfair could shut you off in a moment's notice. And you're like, yes. And they're like, well, that's that's not a great investment. Um, the second area is uh, Betfair runs the network and therefore it sets the price. And so uh, Betfair used to market very early on that winners are welcome. And it was like, this is uh, this is an exchange where you know, unlike the bookmakers, in fact, their very first marketing stunt was death of the bookmaker and that mm. on bad fair winners are welcome. And they ran that for several years until they realized that they, they had winners who were winning an awful lot of money and that bad fair was kind of struggling. You know, bad fair wasn't making quite as much money as they'd like to. And therefore they put in a profits tax and they kind of said winners are welcome, but you got to pay us, pay us the tax. Um, so that is unattractive. And so mm -hmm. you as a, as a winner, as somebody who's like, 
EV positive, to use a poker term, is like, well, I don't want to build a business on something that's going to just arbitrarily try and shut us down. Um, so and pitch so, me the anecdote. Yeah. So th those are, it's, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> the antidote, sorry, the antidote. The antidote to this. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, so, so those are like real problems and that, that's yeah. a fairly common problem in technology. And so we're, uh, crypto and blockchain comes in is you can build a protocol and this is what that text is building that is permissionless and permissionless means that anyone can build on the bad text protocol so they can build their own interface they can charge their own commission on top of what bad text charges but they do not have platform risk because that that protocol is owned by a DAO. it's not owned by a company it's owned by the the token holders of that protocol. And so it's very similar. If you built an application on Ethereum, you're not going to get a call one day from Vitalik saying, Hey, we, do, we don't like, <laughs> we don't like your application and we're pulling you from the network. So that's exactly the same with BetDex. BetDex has no, there's a company BetDex, which will create this protocol. We will then put it out and decentralize it. It'll be owned by uh, uh, the token holders um, and administered by a foundation but we don't control it. So if you decided, oh, I'm going to go and use this, this protocol to do, you know, other service certain markets or do certain things that we, I don't like, I can't stop you. Again, okay. it's permissionless. And so the two things there are, one, you don't have platform risk. You can do whatever you like with it. Mm -hmm. And number two, you don't, you don't run the risk that I'm arbitrarily going to say, you know what, I'm putting up your cost like 40 X um, because the, the costs are actually set by the token holders again, of which you are one. Okay. And how do you monetize this? Yeah. So the way, uh, well, by you, what I'll sort of describe is um, the token holders. Um, so ultimately the token holders own the network. And so they own the, the this protocol. Um, and the way the protocol will make money is by uh, basically it'll take a small cut of every transaction. And by small, I mean, you know, less than 1%. I, and, you know, it's something like point, somewhere between like 0.2 and 0.5% of every transaction. And so that's how the protocol itself generates money. And and you're, the company that you've created owns a percentage of the tokens? So the company, Betdex, whenever we decentralize, we will own a percentage of the network as well. And is that how you monetize and run the business? Is that you get kind of a dividend from tokens getting used? Um, so it's a little bit more complicated than that. So we will own tokens. Our shareholders will own tokens as well. So, and the company, Betdex Labs, in effect becomes more of a supplier to the protocol because we, we, we actually, we employ a lot of engineers that will be building the protocol, but so will other people uh, contribute to the protocol. But what will happen in time is we probably will have a supply agreement with the protocol and say, hey, we are, we're going to provide upgrade services. At some point, it, it may be that they, and this we've seen this in other projects, it comes to a point where the, the company actually says, you know what, the protocol is in pretty good shape. We're actually going to focus on other things. But where their value comes from, from our investors' perspective is, and from ours, is that we are also token holders. And we think these tokens are, are valuable because they actually own this network. So the, the, so if I understand this correctly, there's an organization called a DAO, and the token mm -hmm. holders are the, effectively the shareholders of the DAO. Yes. And they can vote for different organizational change that's right yeah is it the yeah. kind of thing where 51 percent of the token holders control the dow uh essentially yes it depends on you how you put your governance structure together but you know like it is a kind of a democracy and you know classically it would be a lot of things you just go to the vote and so you might have votes on who uh, you know who sits on uh, certain committees or, or or on a protocol for example like if there's an upgrade to the protocol you need a majority of people to say, yes, we want to move to the next, you know, uh, upgrade or, or not. So in theory, you could, you could buy 51% and then take control of the network. Right? In theory. Yes. Okay. And, and potentially this DAO could come to an agreement. We're going to pay a million dollars a month for software development for our 
platform. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and yeah. the proceeds of that would come from the transaction fees generated from, and correct. probably I guess yeah. the sale of the initial, the IPO of the coin, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Although it's, the company doesn't own token. Um, like at that point, what happens is it's sort of things get separated. So founders, employees, and investors also become token holders sort of mm. separately from their sort of employment with our investment in the company. Um, so the company itself doesn't necessarily, or doesn't actually ever hold token. Um, Got it. But there would be an IDO and that IDO would fund the protocol. Got it. Okay. So what's it? So I kind of get the kind of control structure mm -hmm. and monetization. What is the point? Is the point for people to trade, you know, the three o'clock Doncaster just like they do mm -hmm. on, on other exchanges well, or? Yeah. What? So the idea is very much um, that we will also build the first application on the BetDex protocol. So it'll, and it's called BetDex. It's getting licensed in the Isle of Man. Um, and then, so we will market to customers and say, and, I, and, and we'll focus probably more on sports. So like soccer, um, Formula One, golf, um, potentially cricket. Um, and so there, when people turn up, it'll look like a betting exchange and they'll come and they'll bet. But the difference is that um, it will be built on this protocol. And what we will do is encourage other developers to build other clients for it. And they may say, you know what, they want to go. We might say, you know, we don't want to focus on India. Somebody else says, we'll focus on India. Mm -hmm. And they will build a client which will focus on those other markets. And the the great thing about this is all of those bets get pulled in a single in a single on a single protocol. And how are you planning on solving liquidity? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And there's a number of areas that we're working on. Like one is just on retail. Um, that like with Betex, our own application, we're focused on building up a retail presence. Um. In the early days, we're definitely going to have to have market making. Um, and we're also going to focus on a limited number of markets and sports early on to say, look, we're not just going to like throw out hundreds of different sports and markets and not have liquidity on them, but let's just focus on the win markets of major soccer games. Um, and there we can get the liquidity pretty quickly. And are you going to do it yourselves or are you going to try to work with people to do it? Uh, we'll probably work with other people. That's, certainly, yeah. that's not our sort of strong suit. And how does, you know, in, in the real money gaming world, uh, you know, there's so much increased pressure on problem gambling and anti-money laundering and age verification. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that side of the business in the crypto yeah. world? So um, that all happens at the application layer. And so for us, um, like the way to think about the BetDex protocol is for a lot of books that are going to use it, it's kind of this back office, you know, uh, risk management piece that's kind of like it's going to take your bets and you're going to like blow your money onto it and you're going to manage your risk management. For bet decks, uh, what we're doing is um, it will, uh, we will manage those things at our application layer. So our application is going to look after KYC, AML, problem gambling. Similarly, other clients that build on it, they will handle that at their application layer. And what happens a if protocol, a protocol it, itself is kind of agnostic to all of these things. It's impossible to really build that into a protocol. It would be like trying to build in age verification KYC into HTTP, right? Like it's the, the internet itself is agnostic. There's not a company behind it and the companies all exist at the application layer. And what, and, and is the rationale that like, like, let's say I'm like 13 years old in Saudi Arabia, and I build <laughs> a, a sports betting app for me and my friends on, on this protocol. Is that just, it's just out of your hands. Is that the kind of like, it's just in the, it's in the interwebs what, as Al Gore would say. Yeah. Well, like once, once the protocol is decentralized, it, it is permissionless. So anyone mm -hmm. can use it. And so in the same way that, you know, when Tim Berners-Lee put out uh, the protocol for the web, he couldn't then say, oh, I don't like these porn sites or these, you know, illegal, you know, sites. There's nothing really you can do at that point. And so, like, there is a DAO. And so it would be up to the DAO to decide how it should deal with those things. If there's negative, you know, if there's negative building on it, but it wouldn't be down to us as a company because we don't control it. But the the profits from that, activity would flow to the token holders, correct? It would flow to the token holders, correct. Right. Okay. So the DAO does have control and then it would be up to the DAO to decide, well, 
you know, do we want to? And there's a very good example of that recently. Um, uh, Uniswap. So Uniswap is a company, Uniswap Labs, uh, but there's also Uniswap Protocol. Um, Uniswap, uh, there was trading in securities tokens. These are tokens that trade in line with uh, securities. I think it was like Amazon stock. And they removed them from the Uniswap client. So you couldn't trade them on the Uniswap client. But you could still trade them on the Uniswap protocol because Uniswap Labs doesn't control that protocol. And so that's very similar to us, which is mm. if, you're, if you're building a client, you have to take the decision on how you, you know, the risks, you know, the legal requirements, KYC, AML, all of those things. We're going to take them very seriously for our client. And then it's up to those other clients to decide how they want to approach it. And then the second level is at the DAO level, then the DAO has to decide, well, you know, what level do we want to, like, would we support people going into different markets, et cetera. Awesome. Well, th thank you. I, I could talk to you for hours, Nigel. Like <laughs> you, you have had one of the most interesting career paths in, in sports betting and, and we share a lot of passions about exchanges and liquidity and all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for coming on the pod and sharing no your views thank with you. us. And uh, I hope you'll come back and, and tell us how you're doing. I will indeed. Okay. Cheers, Nigel. Thank you.